Okay, so welcome to our second session, which is going to be dealing with the Buddha as philosopher. So we're going to be tackling the Buddha as something like a philosopher, and so also by association, the idea of Buddhism as something like, uh, at its origins or at its core, a kind of philosophy. Now, we're not going to go too deep into what one might mean by philosophy. There's only so many hours in the day. Um, hopefully, though, you've come across or picked up the sense from somewhere that there is a history in Western reception of Buddhism um, and reception of the Buddha that has thought that the category philosophy is more appropriate here than another very slippery term, that is religion, even though you may be teaching this uh, as part of a religious studies or religion, uh, religious education course. Put very simply, there's a long tradition in Western thought about the Buddha that believes he was not the proponent of anything that's best conceptualized as a religion or of ritual or supernatural beliefs or whatever else you want to associate with religion, but instead that the Buddha is better thought of as something like a philosopher. He was concerned with what are better thought of as philosophical questions and moreover with philosophical method, that is maybe critical uh, analytic thinking and also the use of persuasion through reasoned argument. And this when addressing problems to do with things like human nature, ethics, identity, and so forth. Now, if we go back uh, in time to the uh, early 19th century, when the study of Buddhism was in its relative infancy in the West, there was a sense that Buddhism was a religion and full of strange rites, idol worship, rituals, and other things um, that a general population in Europe found very challenging or even heathen. But the middle uh, of that century saw, but the other is the 1800s, saw scholars begin to present the Buddha uh, himself as something a little bit different. And in fact, the very first book length introduction to Buddhism written in any Western language presents the Buddha as explicitly a philosopher. This is Ujim Bonov's uh, introduction to Indian Buddhism. And we read here in this slide, uh, the Buddha lived, he taught, he died as a philosopher. And this idea has never really gone away, and with good reason, because, as we'll be discussing, Buddhist teaching, voiced by the Buddha, who lives and speaks in Buddhist text and tradition, does tackle some topics that perhaps we would want to classify as philosophical, and in a manner that we'd want to maybe call philosophical also. But before we go too far into that, we'd like to highlight that this kind of thinking can go too far, we think. In short, we're not so fond of the idea that the Buddha is best conceptualized as simply or exclusively a philosopher, as we hope that this series of talks, not just today, but the other talks, demonstrates. So you'll also see in this slide that I've quoted an author with whom some of you may be familiar. This is the philosopher A.C. Grayling. But note also there's a big red caveat next to the quotation. I'm using Grayling as a typical author who's knowledgeable about a great many things, who presents a pretty problematic and we think also an informed description of Buddhism. So if I read the slide, Buddhism in its original form and still in the Theravada, small vehicle form, is a philosophy, not a religion. So is Jainism, so most emphatically is Confucianism. The differentiator is that these philosophies are not centered upon belief in, worship of, or obedience to a deity or deities from whom or from which come the commands that construct the correct form of life and belief for the devotee. Now, there's a few problems uh, in what Grayling has to say here. For one thing, he very uh, confidently talks about Buddhism in something like its original form, and this is something where scholars of Buddhism tread very, very carefully. And he then seems to mistranslate the term Theravada Buddhism, calling it a small vehicle. Now we can work out how he arrives at this, but for complete transparency, Theravada doesn't mean small vehicle. Two different ideas are getting conflated here. And central to our topic today, Grayling states without real hesitation or qualification that Buddhism isn't a religion. So too Jainism, another tradition from India, and also Confucianism of China. It seems that he thinks the defining feature of a religion is this belief in worship of deities and so forth. Now, given that the term deity is one that's open to different interpretations, we could make uh, good arguments that forms of Buddhism, including Theravada Buddhism, would still meet this criteria for being religious. But it's still easier to demonstrate that religion as a category is not best defined in the terms that Grayling presents. And we won't spend more time on these remarks now. 
But whereas this session is concerned with how the Buddha could be conceptualized as something like a philosopher, we'd like you to keep in mind uh, this category and think critically about it through our later sessions as well. And this is relevant, especially when we come to look at the role that the Buddha plays in Buddhist practice in our fourth session, and the notion of the Buddha being one among many Buddhas in the fifth session. Put simply, although we can uh, detect the Buddha being something like a philosopher in Buddhist literature, the question is, is he best thought of as this before uh, or instead of anything else? So today we're going to permit and explore the idea that the Buddha is in part well conceptualized as something like a philosopher. But this doesn't mean that that's all he is or that one can readily label Buddhism as simply a philosophical tradition rather than something we think is considerably more colorful and in fact harder to classify. Apologies there, skip too many slides. So one problem of labeling the Buddha a philosopher is that it's not a word that has an easy parallel in Sanskrit or other Indic languages. But if we take it to mean somebody who is interested in the pursuit of knowledge or of truth, someone seeking answers, if you like, then we might see a parallel in the term shramana, which literally means a striver and might be helpfully compared to the notion of a religious seeker is a term we sometimes hear used uh, in modern day discussions of uh, modern religious movements. So in the context in which the Buddha lived, there seems to have been lots of different shramanas, lots of religious seekers who left behind their ties to family and to household life and wandered throughout vast areas seeking understanding or liberation. Many of these were ascetics, so they deprived themselves of food or water or shelter or carried out extraordinary deeds such as standing up for years at a time or exposing themselves to the heat of the sun or fire. And what were these seekers seeking exactly? Well, most were seeking escape or liberation from the cycle of rebirth and redeath, known as sangsara or wandering on, though more often more loosely translated as transmigration or the cycle of rebirth. So belief that all beings were uh, subject to this cycle of rebirth seems to have been largely taken for granted at the time of the Buddha. And Shramana sought different routes to liberation from this cycle. Sometimes it's hard to see uh, in, in our own context why they would have been so motivated by the need to leave the cycle of rebirth. I'm often reminded of um, a song by Victoria Wood in this where she talks about all the great opportunities of being reborn multiple times. Of course, we might think of this as being a positive thing, but of course, it's really important to remember the darker side of rebirth. So namely the fact that all of the suffering is repeated and indeed illness and death. Uh, are repeated. And that's why I tend in my teaching to refer to Sangsara as the cycle of rebirth and redeath, because that just helps to emphasize what's going on here. And of course, we add to that the likelihood of multiple rebirths as animals, for example, not to mention the possibility of rebirths in hell realms, and you start to see the motivation of these shramanas seeking release. These religious seekers are sometimes mentioned alongside another category of person seeking religious truth. Uh, at the same time uh, as the Buddha's own context. And these are Brahmins or um, Brahmana in Sanskrit or Pali. And Brahmins were part of the system of ritual and sacrifice based on the Vedas, the ancient Sanskrit hymns and ritual texts, that is a precursor of sorts to what we now call Hinduism. And Brahmins are often depicted engaging in debate with the Buddha in Buddhist texts. And of course, in Buddhist texts, uh, they always get convinced by the Buddha of the superiority of his understanding. But lots of uh, key Buddhist ideas seem to be modeled on or directly respond to Brahmanic or Vedic ideas. So you can see uh, that at the time of the Buddha, there were lots of different competing ideas in circulation. And that's really the point of where we're starting here. So the Vedic heritage mediated through powerful Brahmins was certainly important. But there were also other influences, particularly from shramanic teachers and groups, including what we now call Jains or Jains, who seem to have been particularly influential in the region in which the Buddha lived. And there are also early Buddhist texts depicting the Buddha in debate and dialogue with Jains. So it makes for quite a complicated picture. And actually, it is one that is still subject to live scholarly debate. So, for example, some scholars, myself amongst them, argue that the notion of the need for escape from a cycle of rebirth probably developed outside the Vedic Hindu context and was only later absorbed into what we now call Hinduism, 
but other scholars disagree. But one thing is clear, and that is that the old textbooks that often present the Buddha as born into a predominantly Hindu society are painfully out of date and even actually downright wrong. And that this isn't just because Hinduism as we talk about it now didn't exist at the time, but also because Vedic and Brahmanic forms of, of precursors of Hinduism were only part of a bigger range of ideologies that were in circulation. So there's lots of early Buddhist texts that show the Buddha in debate with a range of different teachers. Um, there is a famous one of these, the, uh, the Discourse on the Fruits of the Ascetic Life, which is mentioned in the notes to the PowerPoint slide. So if you're interested in finding out more, do uh, download the PowerPoint slide, PowerPoint uh, file after the event and, and take a look at the notes there to find out more. But hopefully that gives you a sense of the context. And we can appreciate this complicated background even better if we think about key episodes on the uh, in the Buddha's life story. So for example, consider the four sites, the famous moment when the young Buddha to be uh, goes out into the world for the first time and encounters uh, an old man, a sick man and a corpse, the, the first three sites, which shock him into a realization that all life involves suffering and death. And then the fourth site is a mendicant uh, or a wanderer. And, and the terminology behind this differs in different texts, but we're talking about a religious seeker here. And in Buddhist art, he's usually depicted as a, a Buddhist monk, as indeed here, uh, although of course there were no Buddhist monks at the time, there was no Buddhism at the time, but there was a model for this. There was uh, the Shramana movement, for the, the model for renouncing and seeking liberation or insight. And so the Buddha-to-be decides that he's going to renounce and he then, uh, we're told in some texts at least, seeks out teachers. And some of the stories of his uh, mission include him learning some quite complicated systems of meditation before eventually dismissing them as ultimately not leading to liberation. He's then said to have tried extreme asceticism, and the image on the previous slide was actually a depiction of that. Uh, the results of this are quite graphically described in the text as well. And he's said to have been so determined in his asceticism, um, particularly in fasting and reducing his intake of food, that he attracted a small band of fellow shramanas as his followers. But when he decided eventually that this wasn't getting him anywhere and decided to accept an offering of food, his followers gave up on him and, and wandered off. So we're told that then he ate his meal and he sat beneath a tree, he entered meditation states and he achieved awakening. So a little bit of a combination going on there of his quest. And then he sets off to find his former followers who then become the first five Buddhists, if you like, the, the first uh, followers of the Buddha, the first people other than the Buddha in that uh, Buddhist dispensation to achieve some form of liberation. So this wider context of the Buddha's life story underpins a lot of key aspects, uh, including some key doctrines, as we might call them. So for example, you've doubtless come across the notion of the middle way. So what is the middle way? So in this context of the Buddha's life story, we're talking about the middle way between a life of indulgence, as emphasized in the first part, that the childhood, the depictions of the childhood of the Buddha to be, and then asceticism, or uh, bodily punishment, which is then embodied in part of his, his quest. And what we find is that, that Buddhism very much rejects these stronger ascetic practices, including those associated with the rival tradition of Jainism. Because the, crucially, the Buddha taught that one needed a rested and nourished body in order to pursue the mental training at the heart of Buddhist practice. And we can see something going on also with meditation here. So the Buddhist meditation system seems to take certain common foundational teachings, including arguably what is now repackaged as secular mindfulness. And then it adds extra elements with a specifically Buddhist metaphysical and ethical twist. So Buddhist ideas and teachings don't come out of a vacuum. That's really the point here. They build upon and respond to what is already there. So in order to demonstrate another benefit of understanding the intellectual debates of the time, we can take an example that is at the heart of the Buddhist system of thought, namely karma. It's worth noting here that I'm using karma as an English term. It's a term that's been adopted into the English language. Uh, the Sanskrit would be karman and the, the Pali would be kamma, but we can very easily talk about karma because it is basically an English word these days. <clears throat> 
And the very basic definition of karma, we might say, is action or deed. But the law of karma is really about actions having consequences. And these consequences are not usually understood as being doled out by any sort of deity. Karma is better thought of as a natural law, something more like gravity. It just happens that bad deeds lead to negative results and good deeds to good results for the person who's doing them. And these results, or fruits as they're very often referred to, can arise in the current lifetime or they can arise in future lifetimes or a combination of both. And indeed it is karma that fuels the cycle of rebirth as depicted quite famously in traditional Tibetan Baba Chakras or Wheels of Becoming. And there's more on that image and on the realms of rebirth in the notes to the PowerPoint. I don't want to go into details of that now because it's likely material you're very familiar with already. And if not, further notes and references in the PowerPoint file. So if the idea of a cycle of rebirth fueled by karma was shared by lots of thinkers at the time of the Buddha, what was the Buddha's own contribution? So here, seeing the Buddha as one in a range of teachers is really quite helpful. So we can see, for example, three rival ideas about karma. The first of these is that karma doesn't really operate. So although most people seem to have been accepting of this idea of karma being important to the, the human condition, there were some teachers that insisted that one's actions don't really matter. And so sometimes they denied the operation of rebirth as well. So we have one life and uh, it doesn't really matter what we do. Uh, and this is finished with one's death. And this position is often referred to as materialism. Others preserved the notion of rebirth, but basically said that nothing can be done to control or escape it. So you don't have control over your karma. And, and that's often described as fatalism. A second rival notion of karma that was circulating is that karma can be dealt with through asceticism. And so we already noted that there are lots of shramanas, these religious seekers who adopted ascetic practices of one kind or another, such as fasting. And often these practices were related to the idea that karma could be controlled either by reducing one's actions in order to reduce the amount of karmic fruit you produced, or through the idea that you can burn off karmic uh, accru accruances by punishing the body. So uh, maybe this idea that you might be bringing the fruiting of bad karma forwards by basically giving yourself a hard time instead of waiting for karma to do so, uh, or other sorts of ideas around how these ascetic practices can actually control your karmic burden. And so often these groups also understood that all actions even something as simple as breathing could be karmically dangerous. So removing karma in this case is the route to liberation because when there's no more karma, there can be no more rebirth. And, and these ideas were very influential in early Jainism, for example, as well as in some other schools. And then the, a third rival idea, this time more associated with Vedic or Brahmanical Hindu traditions, might not have been in circulation at the time of the Buddha, but certainly became hugely influential within a few centuries. And this position held that what constitutes good or bad karma depends on your situation. So, for example, it's good for warriors to fight and to kill, but bad for Brahmins to do the same. And, and this idea is found, for example, in the famous Bhagavad Gita, a key Hindu source. And then linked to this idea is a whole series of specific ritual responsibilities as well. So ritual actions were believed by some groups to have particularly potent karmic results rather than all actions being of equal consequence. So seeing these different competing ideas about karma helps us to see what appears to be Buddhism's unique contribution to this debate. And this might be thought of as being of two parts. So firstly, the Buddha teaches that karma is a universal ethic, ethical process, not one that depends on one's own social status, gender, occupation, or anything like that. To kill is always bad for all people, for example, and, and being part of a ritual sacrifice or a, a dutiful war doesn't change that. And then secondly, the Buddha seems to teach that not all actions accrue results. Only intentional actions have karmic results, and these results are determined by the intention or the mental state behind them. So, for example, an action motivated by hatred might, in its worst case, lead to a hellish rebirth, while an action motivated by generosity could lead to a rebirth in a heaven realm. As the Buddha is famously said to have declared, karma is intention. <laughs> 
So understanding how karma is perceived by the different groups is important because the different conceptions of the problem lead to different proposed solutions. So if you believe that karma is uh, caused by all actions, then you might try to stop all actions. And that's what's behind these forms of extreme uh, asceticism. If you believe that ritual responsibilities are the most important ways to generate good karma, then you'll pursue those. And if, as a Buddhist, you understand that all actions motivated by greed, hatred and delusion are bad, then you'll seek to eradicate those motivations. How so? By mental training, such as meditation that tackles the root causes, comprehensive ethical rules that are designed to prevent the sort of actions that are underpinned by mental states, such as killing or lying, and cultivating good mental states, such as generosity through positive actions, such as giving. So the link between action and motivation is really important here but the motivation is key to understanding the, uh, how you evaluate the action. And this focus on mental states in Buddhist karma theory and indeed across other parts of Buddhist practice as well might be another reason why Buddhism is sometimes presented as a philosophy. Though as we've already seen and we will continue to see, there are a lot of different aspects, a lot of additional aspects too. So where have we got to in our investigation of the Buddha as philosopher? We've established that his teachings respond to and engage with other teachings and ideas in circulation at the time, and that certain key doctrines, as well as key events in his life story, demonstrate the influence of that broader context. We've seen how he reframed the idea of karma and how it operates and placed that at the heart of his own solution to the problem of rebirth. So he's certainly interested in the nature of reality and in the nature of the human condition. But it's worth noting that the Buddha is not presented as interested in all questions, only those that he found relevant to his central purpose. And so in this sense, we might say that his quest was not intellectual, but rather soteriological, seeking salvation. And I want to introduce here a famous simile that you might have come across already. I here present it from a text called The Shorter Discourse with Malunkya, uh, preserved in the Pali Canon. Um, the Pali Canon is the scriptures considered authoritative by Theravada Buddhism, so that is the type of Buddhism uh, that still predominates in uh, Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, so Myanmar, Laos and Thailand and so on. Um, however, it's worth pointing out that a very similar text occurs in other uh, language traditions belonging to other schools of Buddhism, so it's, it's probably quite an old uh, text. And in this text, the Buddha is addressed by a monk called Malankya Buddha, and he wants answers to certain metaphysical questions. He wants to know, is the cosmos eternal or not? Is it finite or infinite? Is the soul distinct from the body or not? Does a Tadagata, that is to say a Buddha, exist after death or not? And Malankya Putta threatens to give up his monastic path if he doesn't get a satisfactory answer. So the Buddha responds at first by pointing out that he never promised to give him answers of these sorts of questions in the first place. And then he uses a simile that's become quite famous. So I'll just read the quotation here. It's an abbreviated form and you can see fuller references again in the notes to the PowerPoint. Wow. So it's just as if a man were wounded with an arrow thickly smeared with poison. His friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives would provide him with the surgeon. The man would say, I won't have this arrow removed until I know whether the man who wounded me was a, a noble warrior, a Brahmin, a merchant or a worker. He would say, I won't have this arrow removed until I know the given name and the clan name of the man who wounded me, or until I know whether he was tall, medium or short, until I know whether the bow with which I was wounded was a long bow or a crossbow, until I know whether the bowstring with which I was wounded was fibre, bamboo thread, sinew, hemp or bark, and the man would die, and those things would still remain unknown to him. In other words, we can all appreciate how silly the man is, and even more so, I should say, in the unabbreviated version, uh, where there are quite a few more things he wants to know before accepting medical help. And the Buddha's point here, of course, is that our condition is urgent. We are suffering with an affliction and we need to concentrate on the cure, not on distracting questions. And the Buddha goes on to say, why do I not answer these questions? Because they are not connected to the goal. They do not lead to awakening. What is declared by the Buddha? Well, suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And many of you will recognize here that this is the Buddha referring to what get referred to as the, the Four Noble Truths, a basic outline of Buddhist teaching. So in other words, the Buddha teaches the path to liberation. He doesn't bother 
with metaphysical speculation, not because he doesn't know the answers. And it's worth noting that Buddhist texts often take great pains to insist that he absolutely does know the answers, but because the answers and indeed the questions are completely irrelevant to the quest for liberation. Though, as Chris is about to explain, there, of course, is a lot more to Buddhist teachings than the Four Noble Truths. And some of these things are things that we might want to classify as philosophical arguments or ideas. So, for one thing, Buddhism teaches, among many other things, that all things in our experience exhibit three attributes or characteristics. And these are often called the three marks or characteristics of things. In Pali, this is tilakana or trilakshana in Sanskrit. That is three marks or characteristics of, of anything that we might know. And I often prefer to stress that these, although often called three marks of existence, they are three marks of experience. And that's to highlight what I think is the main perspective of at least early Buddhist teaching. So yes, teachings uh, by the Buddha make claims about how things are. And so we could say claims about existence, but the perspective these teachings take um, is at least usually uh, with respect to experience. That is to say, Buddhism states how things are as we encounter them. What follows is not an account of everything as it really secretly or ultimately is, if we had the faculties of a Buddha. Rather, if we inspect our experience, if we really pay attention to the content of our lives and what's going on, we see for ourselves directly how things are. Now, arguably, this is an approach with which many philosophers uh, might be happy. And although there are different ways to categorize what's going on here, we might term this something like a phenomenology. That is a study of phenomena. That is the way in which things appear to us, that being the uh, totality of our uh, experience and so our existence. And um, this in the belief that human experience should be the basic framework for an account of what is real. At any rate, Buddhism holds that there are three characteristics of everything we might experience. These are, to use the Pali terminology, which is on screen here, dukkha, anicca, and anatta. In Sanskrit, dukkha, anitya, and atman. So the first of these, the Buddha states, uh, quite often in Buddhist literature, that all things are dukkha. And dukkha is often translated as suffering. I think, though, we can do slightly better as a translation. So for one thing, in the sentence, uh, all things are dukkha, and that's pretty much a translation of a statement we find in Buddhist uh, literature. The word dukkha looks like an adjective, not a noun. So if we say all things are suffering in English, that sounds a bit weird. And indeed, it's also pretty obvious that not all things that I experience are obviously uh, suffering or characterized by suffering. Dukkha can mean suffering, that is obviously unpleasant things, but it can also mean more broadly being not as we'd like. So dukkha can mean unsatisfactory, and that is indeed, of course, an adjective. So all things are unsatisfactory, meaning they are not as we'd want them to be. And this is because all things, including things that appear to be pleasant aspects of our lives or experience, they are also characterized by anicca or impermanence. Things that we experience that aren't obviously unpleasant are still in their pleasantness transient. Youth is fleeting, health doesn't last, we grow old, we die. Every moment of our lives, every aspect of what we experience changes and passes. It's hence all too obvious that everything in our experience is transient, so everything is unsatisfactory. Things are either obviously not as we'd like them to be, or they seem to be pleasant, but then they are necessarily going to change. So again, uh, uh, unsatisfactory. And then finally, and this will be the main focus for the rest of this session, all things are anatta or anatman in Sanskrit, meaning they are not the self. And this is one of the most enigmatic and slippery uh, and also one of the most well-known aspects of Buddhist teaching. What does it mean? I think Buddhist teaching about not self is quite often misunderstood or misrepresented. And what I want to talk about now is not only how best to understand this aspect of Buddhist teaching, but I want to see, uh, show how it exhibits uh, the Buddha in Buddhist literature expositing in something like a philosophical manner. That is, the Buddha teaches using critical reflection, inference, and reasoned persuasion. But first of all, what is meant by a self in all this? 
Let's remember, uh, as we've heard, that in the Buddha's environment, there was broadly accepted the fact of transmigration and action as the cause of this. Um, so we don't simply die, but we face rebirth and subsequent aging and death again and again. Given that this happens, surely there's something in me that would survive death in order for me to say that I am the same being from one life to the next. More immediately, given that my body and mind change throughout my life, surely there's some center or essence to my identity. There's some I, some me, some self that endures, even though everything about my personality, my physicality, they subtly gradually change. Now in Buddhism, there's a pretty sophisticated account of what constitutes our personality, and moreover, the types of things that make up our experience. In Buddhist literature, we find what are often called the five skandhas in Sanskrit or Pali khandhas. And I'm mostly using Pali terminology here because I'm, I'm going to be drawing upon a Pali text in a second. So khanda is often translated as aggregate, but this word khanda can also mean a heap or a pile of things. So these are five heaps or piles of things that are of like kind that collectively make up an account of everything that we experience. So rattling through these five, we've got an experience of ourselves as physical entities, rupa. And this is obvious enough. Um, I have an experience of me as a physical thing uh, made of matter occupying space in the world. But we also have a complex mental life, and this is made up of several, of several different kinds of things. So I have feelings or sensations, vedana, these being the qualitative experience of pleasantness, unpleasantness or neutrality, uh, in relation to anything. And I have what could be translated as conceptualizations, sanya, or perhaps ideas. And I should say there are different translations of these terms out there. These are just the ones that, that I happen to prefer. So this category is a bit tricky, but if I hold up, for example, here, a mobile phone, and you look at it, you see or conceptualize something there as a phone, um, rather than just raw sense data. And similarly, if you picture in your mind, for example, an elephant, there is then a concept or an idea that you have that is present to you. And we have also volitions, sankharas. These are our often basic, um, sometimes or quite often subconscious attitudes or dispositions to things. These are the little opinions one may have about everything that we encounter. So it's a fondness for coffee over tea or an aversion to a particular color right up to a potent attraction one might have to someone or something. So we have, and can also scrutinize these underlying attitudes we have to things. And then last, but certainly not least, we've got our consciousness, vijnana. And this is incredibly busy. Consciousness, after all, is consciousness always of things, that is of sense data. So consciousness, or vijnana, operates through the senses, and it very much depends on them. I'm seeing things, I'm hearing things, I'm thinking things. This is the content of my consciousness uh, in, a con in a continuing fluid stream. And if we cease to see anything or hear anything or touch anything, then our consciousness would seem to become fairly empty. There wouldn't be anything there. So these five aggregates present something like an exhaustive account or attempt to of what makes up our experience, our physicality, our sensations, our conceptualizations, our volitions, our consciousness. And if we did away with each of these, if they each disappeared, we couldn't then really say that we exist anymore. And hence my earlier point that Buddhism works from the ground up with experience and acknowledges that this is the domain that's worthy of inspection or interrogation if we want to properly understand what we are and what it is to live and for Buddhists to transmigrate. So what about this self or this not self teaching? In all of these heaps or bundles of experience, there should be some I or me that endures, one might think. But the Buddha argues, and he arguably seems to prove otherwise. And for this, we could look at what is traditionally held to be only the second of the Buddha's teachings after his awakening, in what in Pali is called the Anattalakana Sutta. So this is meant to be delivered to the Buddha's uh, first disciples. Um, we heard a second ago about him returning to uh, those with whom he, he used to practice. And having talked first of all about the four truths, he moves on to teaching about not self. So this is the discourse, and the sutta means something like discourse, something attributed to the Buddha, on the character of things, lakana, that is there not being the self, anatta. 
So in this, the Buddha is talking to his audience about these five aggregates just discussed, physicality, sensations, and so on. And he encourages his audience to scrutinize the stuff of their own experience, to find perhaps something that's worthy of calling the self. Having just taught about the four truths, the Buddha now goes through each of these five aggregates in turn, and he asks his audience to think about them. And let's just take the first of these, our physical form. The Buddha asks his audience whether their physical form is something that's characterized by impermanence or permanence. And as we must also, his audience acknowledges that physical form changes. It changes a great deal over one's life, but also from moment to moment. And the same, by the way, of course, could be said for the remaining four mental aggregates. So this being the case, then, the Buddha asks whether something that is impermanent is then uh, unsatisfactory, that is not to our liking, or whether it is satisfactory or satisfying. And here, of course, unsatisfactory is translating dukkha. And his audience confirmed that anything that's impermanent is in the end unsatisfying. So this being so, there can be nothing about our physical form, having scrutinized it, found it to be changeable, and so to have nothing there that's of real worth, there's nothing there we should, be, uh, we should consider to be me or mine or myself. Now, this is to say two things. First, on a practical level, there's nothing here in my constitution that's worthy of attachment, that I should treasure or value as really me, because it's all fleeting and unsatisfying. And the same goes for every aspect of my mental life. This isn't just about my body, but every aspect of my thought uh, and my so-called character. But there's also an important philosophical point here. The Buddha is demonstrating that there's nothing in the midst of our mind or bodies, nothing anywhere in our experience, that could possibly be this enduring, unchanging self that passes from one life to the next. Other Indian traditions, like those that we come to call Hinduism and Jainism, are very preoccupied with what deserves to be called the self or Atman or sometimes Jiva and how to find this. The Buddha teaches that searching for such a thing, a thing that's permanent or somehow valuable in our constitution, it's futile or a fool's errand. And this is demonstrated arguably through a kind of philosophical introspection. The Buddha doesn't simply state that there's no enigmatic mysterious self hidden in our being, he goes and proves it. So hopefully that makes some sense. But his teaching about not-self um, is a slippery thing, and hopefully this has become a little clearer rather than more opaque. But this is also still only the beginning of Buddhist teaching about not-self, and indeed of what could be called its philosophical teachings about identity and continuity. Buddhism acknowledges that across death, and indeed throughout one's life, there is change. Nothing in my being stays the same. This being the case, one could ask, how is it that there is then rebirth meaningfully? If there's nothing of me that survives from one, from one life to the next, there's nothing in me that even survives from moment to moment, how can we say that I, as a single individual, have past lives and have future lives? A good explanation of this, which is something that I think students often struggle with, comes in another Buddhist text. This is the Melinda Pangha, or Questions of King Melinda. This is a fascinating text from possibly the last century before the year zero, and the Buddha himself doesn't feature here. Instead, this is meant to record debates between a Buddhist monk called Nagasena and a king in the region of Bactria, that's modern day Afghanistan. And this is likely meant to be the historical King Mananda I. He was a Greek speaking ruler of the second century BCE, whom we know to have been sympathetic to Buddhism. So in these uh, dialogues or debates in the text, the king asks the Buddhist monk, and I think not unreasonably, how, if there is transmigration, but no fixed self that does the transmigrating, how can we say that there is any connection or continuity between one life and the next? And here, as is typical uh, in Buddhist literature, whether the Buddha himself speaks or it's some other speaker, we find the use of similes to make clear uh, what on the surface is not so clear. So, Paraphrasing here the content of the slide, which once again you can uh, download, the king has asked how it is that there could be transmigration, but also not a thing uh, that is reborn. And the image that's used to explain this is a series of oil lamps. And we could use that, or we can just as easily, because they're more common today, talk about candles. If I have a row of lamps or candles, and admittedly the image here is a little misleading, I've got one of them that's just lit and has a flame on it. 
as that is burning down, I can use that to light the second, and then the first flame would obviously die out. And then, of course, this candle could be used to light the next, and so on. Now, we would be wrong to say that it's the same fire surviving across this sequence. Instead, there is a causal relationship between one candle lighting the next, and then, of course, one fades out and the next one carries on. So there's a causal relationship there without anything strictly surviving or enduring. Now, there are two things I'd like to draw out of this. First, in terms of content, there's a clarification about how Buddhism understands transmigration. This given that it's challenging the idea of an unchanging kernel to what we are. In this model, one life begets a next in the manner that one lamp or candle lights another. And the causality at work here, if not already clear, is karma. The deeds I do now must have consequences. And those consequences are a life after this one. And that's for me as a discrete continuity of experience, uh, but not for anything about me that will still exist at that time otherwise. And the second thing to talk about again is the form of this kind of teaching. So in the last few minutes, we've seen two pretty ancient examples of Buddhist uh, teaching, one attributed to the Buddha and one not, that it could employ uh, a kind of philosophical method. So we saw reflective introspection on the content of our experience. And from this, there's an inference that there's nothing in me that warrants being called me or mine or is enduringly. But we've also seen now a couple of examples um, of the use of analogy uh, or examples. We had the example of a man shot with an arrow discussed earlier by Naomi. Um, and this is a common feature of some of what we could call the earliest Western writings that we could call philosophical. I'm thinking here of platonic dialogues and things like that. Similarly with this image of candles, something that might be quite difficult for an audience, this literary king, but also any students, can be explained through the use of analogies. So concluding now, let's remember from the last session that we want to avoid talking about the Buddha as if we've got access to a historical figure by the name Siddhartha Gautama. Now we think there was such a figure, but what we have uh, access to instead are all of these reported stories that were produced over many centuries of what he said and did. Now the Buddha of Buddhist literature is certainly something of a philosopher. He employs reason to persuade his audience of how things are, using methods that certainly remind us of figures like Socrates or others from Western uh, philosophical tradition. But the Buddha, as we saw, is not interested in just any philosophical questions, and this because his aim from the beginning is to liberate sentient beings. There's no interest here in matters of cosmology or creation, but only in what we are, what we are experiencing, and how to alleviate our central problem. And that is beginningless, seemingly endless suffering through a cycle of birth and death. For Buddhists in Asia, it's only been in recent centuries that the Buddha has really been thought of as anything quite like a philosopher. And this isn't really surprising because it's only been in contact with the West that this category philosopher has been brought to bear on the Buddha and his teachings. In other sessions of this series, we'll focus on how the Buddha is more than a man behind these texts and certainly more than simply an eloquent, intelligent teacher. He is, as we touched on last time, remembered as having possessed phenomenal supernatural power and was supposed to embody the liberating truth of the Dharma that is emergent and active in the world. So although we see philosophy at play here, we're finding a lot more as well.